Calling all detectives. Most detectives are satisfied to catch a criminal after the crime has been committed. But I once predicted a murder and watched it happen before my eyes. That is the situation on this page from my casebook. The casebook of Jerry Browning, private detective. A private detective like me, Jerry Browning, does all sorts of things to get business. Ladies and gentlemen of the Thursday Evening Cultural Club, it is my privilege to introduce that well-known detective and student of criminology, Jerry Browning. Yeah, Jerry Browning, lecturer. I give maybe a dozen such talks a year before various groups. I don't get paid much, but I make a lot of new contacts, and a surprising amount of business has come out of those lectures. Over a period of years, I've pretty well standardized my speech, and I've worked out a big dramatic finish. I get on the subject of crime psychology, then... <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, there are about 200 of you in this room. Some married, others not. All respected members of the community, with neighbors, friends, and business associates. Yet, one of you is marked for death. I'll say more. Not only is one of you an intended murder victim, but the would-be murderer is also in this room. Even as I speak, that person is plotting a crime. How to execute it. How to get away with it. It was impossible to tell where the shot came from, but it was easy to see its result. About halfway back in the audience, a middle-aged man slumped forward in his seat. Murder in a crowded lecture hall. A murder that my words had set off. When I told a lecture audience that one person in the room was marked for murder, and another the intended murderer, my words came true before my eyes. The next few minutes bordered on panic. Nobody leaves this hall until the police arrive. Anybody who tries to leave will be placed under immediate arrest. That stopped the rush for the doors, and the possibility of the killer slipping away. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the club chairman in the wings. He was speaking into a phone, which meant that the police would soon be there. Everybody, back in their seats. Take the identical seats you occupied during the lecture. Now I had a chance to get at the victim. It required only a glance to tell that he was dead, killed by a bullet in the back. While Ushers took the body into another room, I learned that he was Drew Lansing, a surgeon dentist, unmarried, well-liked in the community. What's this about somebody getting murdered here? What's going on? There has been a murder. The body's in the other room. The police chief, followed by his deputies, strode down the aisle. Are you the lecturer who predicted the murder? I, uh, yeah, I'm Jerry Browning. The chief gave me a long, hostile stare. Okay, Mr. Browning. Then take another squint into your crystal ball and tell us who'd done the killing. I glanced around the room at the silent audience. Sure, Chief. I'll be glad to tell you. In private. In the other room, a doctor was examining the body. Shot from behind, bullet on practically level course, entered the lung, pierced the heart. Complete autopsy report in the morning, Chief. After the body had been removed, the Chief turned to me. Okay, Browning, who killed him and why? I shrugged. I haven't the faintest idea. Now, just a minute, Chief. I had to say what I did in there. The Chief found his voice. What kind of hocus pocus are you pulling, mister? Saying there'll be a murder and bang, there is a murder. You know something, Browning. I sat down. If you'll give me a chance, I'll explain. What I was leading up to in my lecture was that perfectly respectable people sometimes play with the idea of murder, of killing somebody they don't like. 999 times out of a thousand, that's as far as it goes. Normal people entertain such notions largely as fantasy. Only the rare, abnormal person actually commits the act. The chief wagged his head in astonishment. And you mean, somebody in that audience thought you really know something and got rattled into doing the killing then and there? I nodded. That's exactly what I mean. The killer thought I was trying to warn his or her victim and was determined not to let Paul Lansing escape. <sighs> Brother... What's a miss? A uniformed cop came into the room. Here's a gun, Chief. We found it under one of the seats way up front. The killer must have got rid of it when all the excitement broke out. The Chief took the gun, looked at it morosely. 
We'll probably find it was bought at some hock shop. Have you tested it for fingerprints? The cop nodded. Mary, I won. Okay. He turned to me. I guess you're in the clear, Browning. You can go. We can start bringing in the people who are sitting near Lansing and behind him. Looks like we'll have to crack this the hard way. Wait a second, Chief. They won't get any place that way. If anybody knew where that shot came from, they'd have said so by now. Well, we'll get a dozen stories, all conflicting. Yeah? And what do you suggest? That you use me. The murderer, whoever it is, thought I knew something, still thinks so. Let me go to work on that audience and see if I can get a killer to identify himself. It's worth a try. Come on. It was a queer feeling to look out into the audience and know that behind one of those bland masks there lurked a killer. There is a murderer in this room. One who has made many mistakes. I waited for that to sink in. Then... I will now talk directly to the killer. And after I have finished, I will come down off the stage and point out that killer. I directed my glance beyond the front rows to the back half of the room. You've planned this murder for a long time, haven't you? You've lived with it, gloated over it. This wasn't the way you intended to carry it out. You meant to use that fine alibi. Now it's too late for that. And you've trapped yourself. Can I tell you how I knew? I read it in your face. Do you think you can plan murder, rehearse every detail, savor and advance your victim's agony, and not have all that leave its mark on you? At this very moment, you think you're calm. But I can see panic in your face. I can see your eyes dilate with fear. You're struggling to keep your breathing even and unhurried, but you can't do it. The blood is beginning to mount in your face. Your heart is pounding faster and faster. You can't keep control of yourself any longer. <laughs> In the very last row, a woman screamed and tried to dart out the door. Two cops grabbed her. There is the murderer of Drew Lansing. I sure hope. She was the murderer, all right. One of Lansing's patients who had fallen in love with him had gone so far as to propose to him. Lansing refused. Gently and courteously, but still refused. After that, she felt she had to kill him. Don't ask me why. Warped minds do strange things. Once her nerve broke, she babbled out a full confession, seemed surprised that I wasn't able to read the motives for her crime in her face. Well, I still give occasional lectures. But these days, I have a new finish. Less dramatic, maybe, but easier on the nerves, too. Like I said, you can get away with calling people various things if you smile. But if you call them murderers, you'd better duck. Listen next time to Calling All Detectives. Mystery drama, mystery quiz, and a chance for you to match wits with yours truly, Jerry Browning, Private Detective.